this isn't exactly paranormal. Or maybe it is. To be honest I'm not even sure, but it was spooky at the time. It's gonna be long, and there's not much of a punchline, but maybe slash x slash will find it interesting. Work as a consultant of sorts. Basically I mediate between local governments and the communities they, purportedly, serve. One day I'm meeting with a new client. It's an organization comprised of small-time politicians and business leaders, or so they claimed, in an East Coast city I won't name. Right off the bat, something's off. Our meeting is just a presentation detailing the services that this organization provides. It's very amateurish, and there's no explanation for why they've hired me. Also, the presentation takes place in a strange office building that seems for the most part unused. After the presentation is over, everyone disperses. One guy who really stood out to me ends up calling me into his office. This guy is easily 6 feet 5 inches or 6 feet 6 inches, blonde hair and blue eyes, and built like a brick shithouse. Let's call him Hoffner. He goes on to tell me that his organization has been trying to lure in an Indian casino into his city to help generate some badly needed funds. The natives are resisting their offer. They want me to go in and see if they can be convinced. Pack your bags, Sonny, you're going on a trip. But before I leave Hoffner tells me something kinda strange. He says the natives like to pull the spooky Indian cliché on people, and that they've lost two consultants already. Two different consultants, on two different trips, went to the reservation to talk to people from the casino. Both of them just quit, almost upon arrival, Hoffner says. I'm wondering why the fuck he couldn't tell me all of this in front of everyone else. Then he hands me an itinerary and tells me that I absolutely need to stick to it. Don't talk to anyone that's not on that list. Alarms are going off in the back of my mind. He tells me he's already booked a hotel room for me and hands me the details. That's my cue to leave. Fast forward. I've checked into my hotel and I'm preparing to leave and meet up with my first contact. But as chance would have it, in the hotel lobby, I bump into the legal representative from the casino, let's call her Elizabeth. She almost seems to be expecting me, she asks if I'm a consultant interested in the casino, and I tell her yes. She hands him her business card and tells me she's got an opening for a meeting right now, and to meet her back at her office. Elizabeth's name wasn't on the itinerary that Hoffner gave me, but honestly those things aren't standard procedure. Typically, in this line of work, you let meetings happen organically. So I say, to hell with the itinerary, and head to Elizabeth's office. She's native, of course, about my age, and sharp as a tack. I know a lot about her tribe so when I arrive at her office I chat her up a bit and she seems pleasantly surprised. We spend some time discussing her culture, history, etc. She's speaking passionately when she just stops abruptly. She says I seem to know quite a bit about her tribe. She wonders if I've heard about a certain local legend. Something they call, the keeper, which comes from a native word that translates roughly to, the keeper of the land. I tell her I haven't heard of it, so she tells me the story, which I jot down in shorthand. Later on I typed it up for my personal notes. I wish I could do justice to Elizabeth's phenomenal storytelling, but here is my version. When Europeans first arrived, they killed the wife and daughter of an important chief. The chief, in despair, asked a powerful sorcerer to curse the land the Europeans had settled on. The sorcerer uttered a very powerful curse. As he finished, a strange creature sprouted up from the soil, tall and slim, like a stalk of corn. This creature was the keeper, and it went into the white men's village. But the keeper did a curious thing, it blessed the white settlers with wealth. Moving through their fields silently, it caused crops to grow. Many families were raised on this bounty and the villages expanded. The keeper brought these villages good fortune in trade, and soon they were becoming important cities. The white men in charge were happy, but they knew that something was not quite right. Every year, in the autumn, a handful of children would disappear. This perplexed and frightened the white men. 
But the native tribes were not surprised, because they had heard the sorcerer's curse. For your arrogance, you will pay with the lives of your children. People say it is the keeper who takes them. Although Indians can see him, the Anglos cannot. To this day, the keeper moves through white men's lands and cities, walking in their midst unseen. But he makes his presence known. When the first leaves fall, a slight crackle in the air can be felt. This is the voice of the keeper calling the names of those he has come to take away. Then, in the deep autumn, he plucks the children from their beds. One here, one there, across the entire land, but all at once, gone in the blink of an eye. Some say, this punishment will go on until the end of time. Others say a day will come when white people will finally be able to see the keeper, and his power will vanish. Now, keep in mind, my reason for coming here was to see if Elizabeth's tribe could be convinced about opening a casino out in my client city, so I ask. Are your people hesitant to build a casino in my client city because they believe it's sitting on cursed land? Elizabeth gives me an intense look and asks, do you know what happened to the other consultants that came out here? I tell her what Hofner told me, that they walked off the job. This is where shit begins to really get weird for me. People around here tell a different story, Elizabeth says. They say those men have gone missing, and your clients are right now busy covering it up. What? I tell Elizabeth that things like that end up in newspapers and I would have heard about it. But then a thought crosses my mind. Outside of our private meeting in his office, Hofner didn't mention the previous consultants whatsoever. In retrospect, it feels like he was hiding something. Elizabeth is reading my face, and she says that the hotel where I'm staying, where Hofner reserved a room for me, is the same one that the other consultants stayed in. Then they both went missing, Elizabeth says. Their rooms had been found empty, their beds covered in dirt. The window was open, indicating perhaps the men had slipped out without wanting to be seen. But oddly, all of their belongings were left behind. The men never returned. This is why Elizabeth was there when I showed up today. The owners were growing alarmed by white men disappearing on their property. They had already explained the disappearances to Elizabeth. Then, when they saw my, very white, name on a reservation, they asked Elizabeth to come over quickly. She said the owners told her that after the men went missing, a group of white people showed up and walked into the hotel like they owned the place. They went right into the rooms that the consultants had been staying in and took their belongings and left. The second time this happened, Elizabeth was there. She saw the white people come in and take the missing consultants' things, but one man in particular stood out to her. A towering man with blonde hair and blue eyes. Hofner. As I'm processing this information, Elizabeth's assistant barges in with an urgent matter. Elizabeth tells me she'll have to go. But she quickly scribbles down a man's name and phone number and tells me to arrange a meeting with him immediately. Tell him I sent you. She escorts me out and I leave, scratching my head, and wondering what the hell I've gotten myself into. For a few minutes, I just sit in my car. The leaves are falling, and I think about the strange legend of, the keeper. Then I realize I need to call Hofner. The first thing I do is tell him about meeting Elizabeth. He seems upset and asks why I'm not sticking to his itinerary, but I ignore the question and tell him what I've heard about the missing consultants. Hofner laughs. I told you they'd pull that spooky Indian crap on you. He says I should ignore crazy rumors and stick to the goddamn itinerary. He hangs up. This is not good. My doubts about Hofner and his organization are growing. I look at the number Elizabeth jotted down for me. It belongs to a Dan who, it turns out, is in charge of the casino that I'm supposed to be researching. How odd that his name is curiously missing from Hofner's list of contacts. I call Dan up and arrange a meeting. Fast forward 30 minutes. I'm walking into a casino. Dan, a tall, quiet native man in a suit, greets me at the entrance. He leads me through rows of slot machines where visitors smoke and yank lazily at the levers. 
We arrive at his office where we both have a seat. Then Dan drops a bombshell on me. Your clients never approached us about opening a casino. Ever. I must look confused because he tells me that the other guys who came through here didn't know either. Dan never actually met the other consultants, but he'd heard about them through his friends in town. He'd heard they were going around asking about the casino. When the first one disappeared it was big news. I asked Dan if he ever saw a man matching Hoffner's description at the hotel. Dan says he doesn't go out there often, he spends most of his time at the casino working. Something is kind of puzzling me as we're talking. Why did Elizabeth share that strange legend with me? It came out of nowhere, and immediately afterward she mentioned the missing consultants. So I cut to the chase. I asked Dan if he would be willing to open a casino in my client's city. There's no hesitation. No. Why not? I ask. His answer is vague, something about, no such plans to build there right now. I tell him it's been suggested to me that there's some concern about building on cursed land. Dan becomes visibly uncomfortable and changes the subject. He says that actually, even though he doesn't visit the hotel very often, the owners are his friends, and he speaks with them frequently. They did tell him something strange about the white men staying at their hotel. They told him that the consultants had both seemed fine upon arriving. But on the first night, going to their rooms, they had seemed unnerved by something. One of them even asked if the hotel had security, looking paranoid. Both had disappeared on the morning of the second day. Dan pauses. There's a long silence where neither of us say anything. The only sound is the faint clanging of a slot machine's bell indicating that somebody just hit the jackpot. Then Dan says that if he were me, he wouldn't be staying here tonight. That hotel isn't safe for you. The way he says it gives me goosebumps. I'm thinking about how odd my first meeting with Hoffner was. I'm wondering if he's even who he says he is. But then I wonder, was he right? Could these guys just be pulling some spooky Indian crap on me? And I'm still not sure why the hell Elizabeth told me about that strange legend. So I decide to ask Dan about it. Point blank, I say, I'm not going to leave unless you tell me the truth. Is there some truth to this story? I feel silly asking, but Dan doesn't laugh. He just says, okay fine, and leans in. In a hushed voice, he tells me a story. There's something I'm not being honest about. Turns out, he did go out to the hotel. Apparently, Dan used to be law enforcement. When the second consultant showed up, the hotel owner was afraid he'd go missing just like the first one. So he contacted Dan and asked him to keep an eye on the hotel overnight. So after dark, after the guy had gone to bed, Dan walked around on a patrol. Dan's walking around the perimeter of the building. He passes by the consultant's room a few times, and nothing seems out of the ordinary. He's circled around and is near the front of the building when he hears a strange noise. He freezes in his tracks. I knew that noise, he told me. I'd heard it before. It's coming from the back of the building. He's very frightened, but slowly Dan begins making his way over to the back of the hotel. His gun drawn, he begins to pray. The whole time this strange crackling like hissing static is in the air, Dan can feel it on his skin. As he approaches the back of the hotel the noise grows louder. Full of fear, Dan forces himself to turn the corner. But there's nothing there and it's silent now. Dan realizes, I've been fooled, and turns around, hurrying back to the consultant's room. From a distance he can see the curtains blowing wildly in the wind. The windows open. Rushing over, he peers into the room. The consultant's bed is empty. The man is gone. He runs inside and tells the owner. The two enter the room. There's no evidence of a break-in. There aren't any footprints outside the window except for Dan's boot prints. Everyone had seen the consultant enter his room. Then Dan carried out his security patrol. 
As far as anyone knows, the consultant was there one minute, and gone the next. And even stranger, the bed is covered in dirt. Dan finishes his story. I'm finding it hard to remain skeptical, Dan sounds incredibly sincere. I ask him, you said you'd heard the strange sound before. From where? Dan says he'd heard it once near his grandparents' house when he was just a boy. It seemed to be coming from a strange creature that was walking around in a field. Not an animal, but something else. Something that didn't look human at all, but walked like one. He ran inside and told his grandparents about it. They told him not to worry, that it wouldn't hurt him. I asked him if he knew what it was and he said that some people say it's a protector, and some people say it's just a weird spirit. The only thing people really agree on is that white people can't see it, but we can for some reason. Usually, it's not seen on tribal land. When it is, it's because there's a white person around. Dan told me that's probably what had scared the consultants. It might have been following them. Something about it makes white people scared even if they can't see it. There's also one other thing people agree on about this spirit. Everyone knows it takes white people. To be honest, there's not much more to this story. After my meeting with Dan I called Hoffner up and told him I didn't feel comfortable carrying out this project. If he was angry, he didn't show it. He just hung up on me. There really were a lot of red flags about this project that I should have seen, but I was pretty young and hungry for work. After looking up Hoffner's organization recently, I'm not even sure it ever existed. I think whatever's keeping Dan and his people from building a casino out there in that city, it's probably for the best. So I thought X would like this story because at this point I've mostly gotten over it. This takes place when I was a kid in the mid-90s with my parents overseas in Spain for a vacation. It was called Matilda Ride. We were between a major city and a smaller, yet still kind of big town in central Spain. The town was basically an oldish mining town that was still somewhat going strong, but was slowly falling off the map. We decided to stop off in the town. As it has a few more American things we recognize and as little kids me and my sister don't want to eat the good ass food over there and instead want chicken fingers. In the town we look around for a bit and I spot a Thomas the train looking thing in the side of a large mountainish hill with kids lined up outside of it. Begged my parents to go so they decided to split up, my mother taking me and my dad taking my sister. It was called Matilda Ride. It really was something like Matilda's Riders or something but horribly translated into English. It was a small poorly made version of James sort of like the picture I posted with this but was slightly faded red so it looked pink. The train was on the tracks of an old minecart system that was barely big enough to fit the engine and all the cars onto it, often making me get scared that the side of the engine would crash into the walls of the mine. It didn't however, but it was obvious the kids were all on edge when we entered the ride. The cart was too small for an adult to sit in it, so many of the parents stood on the outside for the engine to get going. It had a voice box in each cart saying things in Spanish, then in English. Things like Matilda goes through the magical tunnel to find her friends, and beware. Danger is around the corner, but all in a slightly gargled manner because of the voice box's age. The first thing we saw other than the walls of the cave were a few scenes of a magical mine, where there were poorly made mine carts on a small miniature set that aimed to make it look like. The cave was far bigger than it was too little effect. So far it seemed like a poorly put together ride from a shithole area of the country. As we began getting further into the ride it was turning out to be some fun at least. Until we got to a certain point where the room was more than lit up. At that moment I can see the cart behind me which was the second before the caboose. Was noticeably more worn. More freshly worn than old as many of the other carts were fine aside from a scratch or two. This caboose cart had some stains on it towards the side but the kid didn't seem to mind at all. They had some of that shit on them too. My first though was that this guy brought fucking pudding onto the train and as a narc I began, saying he had food on the train to the conductor of the ride, that he broke the rules and the kid didn't respond. You can see where this is going. The conductor repeats himself three times before getting a bit panicked, so Stan had food. The conductor jokingly calls to the kid saying if he had some flipped the train at the actual next stop which was three seconds away and checks on the kid in full view of all the other kids. 
The kid was quickly taken away after a small radio talk in Spanish before the Spanish kid screamed, resulting in some commotion and a couple of other guys coming in and removing the kid and all the usual stuff you do in this kind of emergency. The train car was detached and the conductor began again like nothing happened. I know I'm jumping straight into the action here with a thing like this, but that's how fast I remember it happening. Me making a fuss about the kid having food. The conductor realizing the kid was actually dead, and then moving on after a minute or two of messing around with them. After that incident most of us were full on crying, some kids vomited from crying so much, and others were having a hard time breathing from all the wheezing they were doing. The conductor of the train quickly tries to calm us down by moving on to the next segment rather, than just getting us all out of there ASAP, but once he realizes that it won't work, he just skips the remaining two areas and leads us out, the conductor, two workers, and a few others usher the mother of the child inside a little office in one of the tunnels as far. Off in the distance ambulance sirens are heard. My mom takes me out of there as fast as she can to the area she said she'd meet my father back up at. After about 15 minutes of waiting they return and we leave after my dad gets me chicken tenders. Not even trying to joke here, that's literally what he did to calm me down. As we were getting in the car to go back to our hotel. I looked over to see the ambulance bringing the kid in and noticing him cough harshly, so he was still alive. The blood seemed to be coming from his arm so it's safe to assume he lived from all of this rather than dying right there in the train car. Must have passed out instead and been mistaken as dead. I've tried my fucking hardest to look this shit up so bad. But every mention of Matilda ride I get is either some random shit about the movie Matilda or a ride from Disney or something. I'm certain it closed down because of it else it would have been featured on some clickbait article or something by now. Okay X, I was obsessed with Goatman, Skinwalker, mimicry stories for a while but I haven't looked in a while and then this happened to me last night and now I literally cannot sleep or stop shitting my pants due to its proximity to my house. I'll try to green text as much as I can. But first background, I'm 21 and a college senior from CT. Well I live in a semi-rural area about 20 minutes to closest supermarket. Fast food. I go to school in Washington, DC. Not the nice part, either. The part where crackheads are a real thing and cops are reassuring rather than troublesome. I've definitely seen some shit in my day. It would be good to mention here that I'm not some glandular freak, but I'm about 6'1 and 240 out of muscle. But lord knows I could drop 15 pounds I love to smoke, pot, get drunk and eat. Sue me. Being the good student that I am. I picked a real major accounting. And I interned for a mid-sized P, our firm doing accounting bitch work and getting paid $20 an hour. College is expensive as fuck though so I deliver pizzas at night, after the office closes. It's a cheat. Drunk food kind of pizza place that has an absurdly large delivery radius and is around 20 minutes from my house, 5 minutes from the beach. My place is north of there and we deliver probably another 15 minutes past my house. I'm actually typing this at work in between examining the fine print on our client contracts to ensure we are charging them every penny we can cheat bastards so basically. The further north you go from the pizza place, the more rural it gets. I work until close, and this occurs around 9.45 p.m., be me. In the back, folding pizza boxes, like a good little corporate bitch. Counter girl comes back with a delivery slip, she tells me the customer sounded weird on the phone. Kind of like he was talking through a fan or through his hands and that he was almost like gurgling. My DC experience instantly makes me think crackhead, although around here it's way more likely to be some benzo freak or painkiller addict automatically assuming some weird interaction will occur. Look at address, see it is in kind of bumblefuck. I'm a little mad cause I don't wanna drive that far but fuck it, it's the weirdest ticket I'd ever seen. I ordered a large pizza with anchovies, ground beef, ham, sausage, pepperoni etc. Literally 15 worth of extras, I go ask the counter girl if it's right. She says she thinks so, she couldn't really make it out though so she said, she did her best. She's like 16 so I cut her some slack, as soon she was daydreaming and called the number back. Phone rings 5, 10, 20, 30 times, no answer, hang up. Call again. Phone goes right to the number you have dialed does not have a voicemail box that has been set up, yet. Goodbye. Okay then dot jpg. Manager decides to just make the pizza as order and proceed from there. 
deliver a pizza to a hilariously obese and blackout drunk couple invited me and for drinks but I don't drink or smoke when I work. Hope someone else took weird pizza. Surprise no one did it's my turn. Degrudgingly take the pizza and get in my car. Enter address into phone. It's on a side street adjacent to a park locals call open space, which despite the name is about 500 acres of straight woods, it's about 25 minutes away, basically the edge of our range. Put on some dubstep judge me and crank my turbo subi judge me more out to this road. If you're not from a rural area, this can be hard to explain. Winter in the woods is scary. There is never a single sound, ever. Unless there's something larger than a cat walking around, it's you and dead silence. Finally get to address, there are a few houses on the street that they sit on probably five acres so they are spaced out a fair amount. Looking for number 1134, I passed an 1130, then a long long stretch of nothing, then 1144, WTF.JPG. I just want to get this over with and get the next delivery without getting stabbed by some tellhead. Over a fucking pizza, call the number, rings ring stops ringing. There's no sound but instead kind of like a buzzing or a humming. It's hooked up to my car stereo and it's getting louder and louder until I just hang up because I don't want it to ruin my speakers. Windows are fogging up cause at this point I'm pulled over between those two houses. Right when I roll the windows down I am overcome by the odor of decaying trash. Like driving through Newark NJ. Fucking gross so I put the car in first ten. I start pulling towards the next house. At the end of the driveway there's a stanchion with a light on top. Gonna pull into this house and knock and ask if maybe they gave the wrong number over the phone. Makes sense for a pillhead. I'm probably 100 feet away when I see someone step out of the darkness into the light at the bottom of the driveway. Good it's the fucker that ordered. Expecting this guy to be all over the fucking place. Leaning over and being fucked up. Guy is it that fucked. Stopped the car about 10 feet from him. Black coat that looks three too big for him. Even though he's probably got five inches on me. Don't look at him at first. Getting pizza out of car and getting ticket and change as I talk. Hey sir sorry about the wait and the calls. This is pretty far. No response. Realize I should be watching him considering the signs. The smell is still pretty pungent, but I know it's not trash day. I get the pizza on the roof of my car. He is standing under the light on the opposite side of my car. So I got out of my driver's seat and went to driver rear to get pizza. Put pizza on roof of driver. Rear. Guy is probably 10 feet away from passenger rear. I shunly pay enough attention to get a good look at him. Giant tall. No shoes. Ripped up jeans. Stains everywhere. Big jacket as mentioned. Look at his face. Sunken eyes. Can't even see them with the light. Getting real sketched out cause guy hasn't moved or said a word. Stop the process and just stare at the guy. He is staring right at me with those freaky fucking eyes. His head is sort of bobbing side to side. But not in any fluid sense at all. Kind of like a car. Door. Like how it stops at halfway open. Then you give it another shove and it stops at all the way open. I watch his head do this in no real pattern for probably 10 seconds. Starting to get really uneasy between the stench and the head thing and the eyes and the knot. Fucking answering. I stand frozen and so does he. Without breaking eye contact I take my phone out of my pocket and hold it level with the roof. So I can look at the guy and my phone at the same time. Go to recent calls. Call the number for the guy. Call it. Phone starts ringing but I hear no phone anywhere. Then out of the quiet of the woods. I hear. Faintly. So so faintly. A fucking cell phone ringing back in there maybe 50 or 100 yards away. This is my kicking myself for not getting my CC yet. This is me almost shitting myself. The guy's just standing there still doing the head thing but I swear I see that fucker smile. Finally get the courage to speak. UHH. Can you please come get this? Also I think you may have dropped your phone when you were hiding a body or whatever in the woods. Nervously laugh, still thinking maybe this guy dug too deep into the prescription bottle or found some PCP or some shit. I see his mouth open, head still bobbing, feet planted to ground. He makes sort of a low guttural, quick grunt, then a high grunt, then a low grunt. They are sort of soft, kinda like someone clearing their throat. I've shut the rear passenger door at this point, and I'm ready to book it to the driver's seat if I got to. Just as I go to call that phone again, I hear words. The phone's not mine. The pause between the and phone's net was way too long. Phone's net literally sounded like one word. Mine came off an octave higher. My mind is DEFCON 5 like just full panic attack. Knees are weak. 
and literally about to peace out. I push the pizza to the far side of the roof away from me. Finally muster out sir. You're freaking me the fuck out. I have a point for 5 van less than $20 on me dot dot. Please come take this so I can leave. When I say this the head bobbing stops. His eyes are dark and burning a hole through my skull. Opens his mouth again. It was his. What? I say. Stunned. Double quotes it was dash his dash the phone was his. The guy comes towards the car. Not a step but like one huge muscle spasm that propels him forward. Fefina was as he repeats. I'm on the verge of tears at this point. Standing next to open driver's side. Tietze is on roof over passenger rear door. Guy jerk jumps once closer to the car. Thephone is not his anymore. I blubber wordless and then gathering man balls I scream and gonna call the fucking cops and blow your fucking drug addict head off if you don't get the fuck out of here. I see this fucker smile this creepy fucking smile and without moving his mouth I hear him say in a completely different voice. A voice I've never heard before go away. Stop following me. I will call the police. In one big jerky motion the thing reaches forward. Takes the pizza off the top of the car and places a couple round things that I later identify as quarters on the roof surrounded by dark liquid that spreads over the roof. I don't even think just get in the car and peel out down the road. Leave the hot sleeve for the pizza. Leave the shit on the roof. Don't even close the door all the way. I go down the road at about 80 for a quarter mile then pull a U-turn cause I don't want to get even more lost with this psycho here. I whip down the road past the place where he was. Nothing. Finally get to the end of the road. There's a stop sign to merge with the main road. Look right to make sure it's clear. Look left. This thing's face is 12 inches from my own when I turn. Practically shit myself. Peel down road. Finally make it back to pizza place. Shaking like bloody hell. Smoke a joint just to calm me down which I never do when I'm working. I walk in the front door of pizza place. Hey Ann and that guy. The open space house just called back. He said you forgot some food but he only ordered the pizza right. He said come back ick. I start crying. Look at my phone which had been thrown through the car with my driving. 14 fucking missed calls from that number. Literally in tears. All the voicemails are empty except the last one. All I can hear is ragged breathing and those low gruntings. Fucking bawling my eyes out in front of this hot ass counter girl and I don't even give a fuck. Sit for 10 minutes and calm down. Remember the change on the roof. Go out to car and turn on flashlight. The roof of my car was covered in the most viscous weird liquid. But it smells like blood and I throw up immediately. In the panel gap between my trunk and the end of my rear window I find the quarters. Covered in the same maple syrup thick goop blood shit and stuck to it are soft little chunks of what I can only imagine is tissue. Go to open my car and my blood turns to fucking ice. There is a single line of blood going from the front quarter panel to the driver's side door. Did the fucking thing tried to open my motherfucking door when it was next to me at the stop sign. Tactically cry and poop my pants more. I go back in. Tell counter girl to try and call the number again. She tries over and over and over but the phone goes right to voicemail. Next morning I give the number to my uncle who is a police captain a few towns over. Says the number is from a burner phone. Paid in cash. Basically untraceable and it appeared to be off now. I sleep with the lights on now. It'll be lurking for comments or suggestions or something like, is this fucker gonna stalk me and kill me or call me again and fucking terrify. Hey stalker, hope you enjoyed the video. If I could trouble you, give a like and a sub, it really helps the cause. And since you're already here, why not watch the next video? Anyways, stay comfy. Cortisol is bad for you.